American mathematician Edward Lorenz once said that the flap of a butterfly's wings in China could set off a tornado in the Western world months later. Since the world became a global village, and since the explosive development of the Chinese economy, the global growth in credit and in the role of hot money in the financial system, every Chinese vibration has caused a lot of turbulence. Or are they more than just vibrations? Oceans of liquidity, artificial liquidity, I see storms coming. Could a weakening Chinese economy, coupled with the uncertainty about what China really thinks and wants, herald a global catastrophe? Could we be witnessing the last convulsions of the old familiar world and the birth of a new order, the product of China? Bijna elke patatzaak in Nederland wordt overgenomen door een Chinees. Merk jij wat van een cultuurverschil? The great flaw in the Western attitude towards China is the assumption that it should be like us. This is Backlight. Welcome to your future made in China. At the end of 2015, in a distinguished London hotel, a new European bank was presented to the world, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. This bank was initially established to finance infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia, but in no time it was regarded as an alternative to the established order of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. These two had controlled the international money supplies for decades and they had tailored economic collaboration and developments according to Western standards and interests. On the financial cooperation between China and Europe. To the great annoyance of the US, Great Britain also joined this new Chinese bank. According to China watcher Martin Jakes, author of the book When China Rules the World, this was a historic event. 2015 has been a historic year for Chinese-UK relations. And it started with a dramatic development that no one really foresaw, which was the decision of the UK to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Until that moment, the 21 members were all from Asia, and then suddenly the UK joined against the opposition of the United States, which had been lobbying hard against countries joining the AIB. Now that is really significant, because it reaches into the heart of the West, into the heart of the Western Alliance. I think what it means is that the rise of China is transforming the geometry of the world. It's unimaginable that in 10 years' time, the international financial system as we know it now will still be intact, because it won't. It will be new, and it will be drawn increasingly gravitationally towards China. The man in charge of this new bank is Jin Li Chuin, formerly employed by the World Bank. He is very outspoken about a new standard for leadership in the international financial system. Over the last three decades, we managed to lift 600 million people out of poverty. We do not intend to have China's development experience fully rep replicated in other developing countries, but we believe this is inspiration. That's why we want to have this back. I think that it's an introduction also of the way in which the Chinese see the transformation of their own society because their understanding is this, quite simply, that really China was transformed by its economic growth. And crucial to this economic growth was infrastructure, huge investment in infrastructure. And they, their conception is that this is vital to the transformation of the developing world. I think they have a feel, they have a sense 
a priority for concerning the developing world, which is quite different from the way the West and the developed world looks at it. However, we believe to have a new development approach to helping developing countries tackle poverty reduction, environmental protection, improving the livelihood of these people is key. And we would like to have a new development approach. That is why the Chancellor leader wants to have this bank. That is why we want to have this bank to be managed by the highest possible international standard. But let me qualify this statement. When we say international best practice, I'm sorry, Martin, this is not the Western standard. The international best practice is not the Western standard. It's a standard Western countries, Asian countries, Latinos, we all work together to create. The international standard incorporates the best of experience, development experience over the last half century. And I'm proud to say China's development is a part of this experience. Maybe I should stop here so that you could have questions for me. Martin Jakes lived in Hong Kong for many years. For a long time, he wondered at a number of Western assumptions about Chinese developments, which according to him are way off the mark. The time has come for a new interpretation of the future. This is a different way of thinking to what you see. They know it's not their system. China doesn't bear the same relationship to the international system as the United States. The United States was the architect, the founder, the patron, the landlord. Yeah. Really, China's like the tenant. So the Chinese are not under any illusions about all this. You know, that this is a world calibrated by and um, made in the first instance for the United States and 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 also for Europe, especially historically Western Europe. So, um, so I think what their approach is and will be is step by step. If they identify a problem and a need, they will step forward and make a suggestion. They didn't use the step forward because for a long time they just kept quiet because they didn't want to upset the boat, they knew, you know, they didn't want to antagonise unnecessarily um, and they were too preoccupied with dragging themselves up by their bootstraps, you know, out of poverty. So that was the Chinese preoccupation. Now they're in a different situation. They can start thinking, well, you know, about the world. You know, that's part of what the Chinese dream is about. What place are we going to occupy in the world? The Chinese president launched a new international bank on Saturday in Beijing that's being seen as a rival to the US-led World Bank. US opposition has failed to deter its allies from signing up to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, including Australia, Britain, Germany and South Korea. The Chinese-inspired or Chinese-led or Chinese-shaped globalisation is a new era that is unfolding before it. The Asian Investment Bank is part of a huge Chinese initiative called One Belt, One Road. China is initiating and financing big infrastructural projects aimed at connecting a growing number of countries with China at the core when the new Silk Road will be a fact. This new network started with countries in Eastern Asia, but soon expanded to include Pakistan, Iran, Russia, Turkey, and a number of European outposts. The Greek port of Piraeus is one of them. In 2015, when Greece was effectively bankrupt and Europe made increasingly severe demands on the Greeks, China saw its opportunity. Costco, a Chinese state company, took over large parts of the Greek port. This is where the contours of the new Chinese world order become visible. <laughs> When Chinese 
，我们有我们的优势。我刚才所讲的一号码头，他们仍然是制度上的问题。现在的希腊，在某个方面，就像中国改革开放前一样，要让我们希腊的这些员工感觉到我们中原人的一种正气。叫做正能量，啊，所以我们的一言一行，我们体现了我们中国人的风范。哎 ，good， 听三点。OK， 放那行。There is a presumption that we are the model for everyone else, that everyone else should be like us. There is an assumption that as they develop and they modernize, they westernize. And of course, there is an element of truth in that, but the assumption that modernity only comes in one size and one form and it's a Western form is deeply flawed. It is wrong. We have been able to assume for the last 200 years that the world's furniture is ours. Why do so many people speak English? Why, why is the dollar, you know, or before that, the pound, the world's currency? Um, why are the global institutions our institutions? IMF, World Bank, it's been our world, we've owned it and we won't anymore. So the world will become, is becoming, I don't need to say we will anymore, is becoming less and less Western and less and less therefore familiar to us. So we have to make a big shift in the way we think. We have to develop a new kind of respect for the other, for other cultures for other ways of doing things. And this is going to be very difficult. In the new world order, it will be important for us to understand China. How does China think? How does the country determine its goals? What is their vision of the future based on? We visit Yang Shui Tong, a political strategist at Tsinghua University in Beijing, he studies the ways in which traditional Chinese schools of thought can contribute to the foundations of a new order in which China will be the leader. So this is my book. I argue that China will become the superpower by... This Chinese people have such a belief. They are a political decision. In some ways, they are the same as Marx. What is their thought? They say that the human is a political creature. 当人们的生活水平改善了以后呢，他们的这个思想观念呢就会发生变化。那当他们的生活的物质生物质生活条件一样的时候呢，他们的思想想法会一样。这是他们认识中国的错误的根源，就是他们是个经济决定论者。他们不知道人是一个政治动物，人他对世界的认识，他不仅仅来源于他的物质生活，还要来源于他的社会生活。中国现在需要的是什么呢？中国希望重新挖掘中国古代的政治思想，比如我做的道义现实主义的理论研究，就是从先秦的政治思想开始的，去研究中国古代的呃外交思想，然后借鉴来发展现代的国际关系理论。那么我知道，在音乐、在医药、在许多行业里，在建筑很多行业都在走这条路。这个社会失去道德。拜金主义严重，导致了这个社会出现了人们崇拜金钱，不讲道义，没有道德。所以这从这意义上来讲，我觉得我们确实从中国来讲，中国需要在一定程度上重新借鉴我们中国古代的政治思想来治理这国家。然后我们从二零零四年开始，我们就开始重新读中国古代先秦的著作。没有没有，从这开始念。
，从这，他是强调，在这一段里面就说要这个，呃，治理国家要一定要这个学这个，而且对这个统治者来说要学这个。哦，对，对于个人来讲，对个人他没这个要求。那他人不学你看这个都是对君子来说。那人不学不知道。我觉得这个都是对君子的要求，而且这一点我觉得也是这个古今不同的，就是所谓善之于下于不疑，就是有一部分人永远是下于，但是对于这些人，这个要管理他们，这个没有说这些下于这个也要学的。之前的那种呢，就是都希望中国强大。强大到什么程度呢？就是用我们自己话，强大到我们的汉唐盛世。那么那个时候呢，中国不仅仅是它的自个儿经济水平，它的 GDP 的规模在世界上第一，而且它文化在世界上占有最优先的地呃地位。所以当时呢，和周边国家进行贸易，取得了这个关系也有很好的发展，和周边国家关系也比较好。我的想法就是说，中国希望的中国梦，就是说要恢复。中国当年曾经拥有的那种国际社会受人尊重的地位，一个世界能否向正面、正确的方向发展，取决于这个领导国、这个主导国能否给世界提供一个正确的方向，然后促进他们向前发展。所以这样呢，就是说，如果把它说到我们生活里边更简单一句话，叫做“兵熊熊一个，将熊熊一窝”。<笑>也就是说，中国需要一个正确的、有能力的领导。The role of government is very important in China, and now that is not new. That is not new. If you look at Chinese society since what 2,000 years, creation of the modern Chinese polity, and so on, with the victory of the of the Qin Dynasty, what grew up was a society in which the state was always very important. And its role was seen very different to Western society. The state was viewed in familial terms. You know, Confucius' idea was that、um, the emperor should model himself on the role of the father in the family, a benevolent father. You know, if he was a bad father, he'd be a bad emperor. And so, so the Chinese view the state as the ordinary people view the state as,、um, you know, quite paternalistic, but also in a A sort of familial way, you know. Whereas we don't in the West, we think of the state as the government as being alien, you know, as out there and basically, you know, in, almost in transactional market terms. You know, it either delivers or it doesn't deliver. And I think that,、uh, uh, you know, the, the Confucian values are absolutely fundamental to the way in which Chinese society works. Thing of two thousand years ago. This is a very, very long tradition. So, modelling themselves on the father or the great leader's football ambitions, there are thousands of Chinese entrepreneurs ready to realise them. One of these is Wang Huai, an investor and the owner of a sports marketing company serving three hundred million soccer fans. In no time at all. He became the new owner of Ardo the Hague, a football club in the Dutch Major League, and he had major plans right from the start. If I say that one day, when I talk about international football, when I talk about Holland football, I talk about the first thing I think about is the Hague. The Hague is the Hague. I talk about the Hague. I think that's what I think. One year later, however, the excitement has evaporated. Promises were broken. And nobody seems to know what Wang does or doesn't plan to do. Actually, I think in the Hague, in the Hague, the Hague has already been around for 110 years. It has already been very healthy and has already been very modern. It 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 has already been very modern. 
，我觉得一定要是改变一个模式，就是思这个思想的模式要改变，那也就是说要给它带来变化。所谓的变化，那么我们面对的是哪儿呢？除了它本身成绩的提高，那么它这个呃价值的提升，还有它这个知名度的提升等等的，那我觉得应该是面向的中国市场。The former owner of Ardo, Mark van der Kallen, sold the club to Wang. Martin Fontaine was the club's director at the time of the deal. Now they both observe huge cultural differences, which are not as easy to bridge as they expected. It was very clear when I was in January last year at the company United Fans. Then, then, yeah, then you sit there to wait. Now I'm used to it in Vienna. You sit there to wait, and then you sit there to wait for the people to come in until the boss comes. And the boss sits in the middle, and there are four people on the left and four people on the right, and they are just writing everything. And he is the only one who does it. En dat is heel anders. Wij zijn natuurlijk toch gewend uh, gedelegeerde verantwoordelijkheid. Ja, uiteindelijk is het in de directie en de raad van commissarissen die daar succesvol mee om moet gaan. Hè. Dus of ik daar nou zit of meneer Wang, dat maakt aan zich eigenlijk niks uit hè, voor het beleid van de club. Alleen ja, meneer Wang heeft natuurlijk wel allemaal verwachtingen uh, gewekt. Door te zeggen, ja, we, we gaan Europees spelen, ik ga investeren. Nou, dat... Dat heeft hij natuurlijk wel op zich afgeroepen en daar gaat nu een beetje discussie over. Hij wilde ook opeens uh, dat er weer natuurgas kwam. Dat moest maar binnen een half jaar komen. Uh, okay. Of er moesten twintig trainers uh, van de jeugdopleiding uh, moesten binnen twee maanden naar, naar, naar China. Ja, dat werkt zo niet. En, uh, dat zijn natuurlijk de lessen. Uh, net zoals je hebt een, uh, een begroting voor de KVB. Daar moet je aan voldoen, en anders uh, raak je een licentie kwijt. Uh, het is niet zo, ja, ik ben eigenaar, dus ik doe uh, wat ik wil. En, uh, dat zijn toch... Uh, Een hele belangrijke les die hij moet hebben geleerd. 其实呢，你比如说这个比较典型的一个这个例子哈，就是说双方的交往的时候呢，就是按照中国人习惯吧，比如我们在讨论一些事情的时候哈，呃，可能呢大家会这个讨论的时候是一种情况，比如说呢，哎，有些事情行，这事情可以做，好，咱们咱们去做。但是呢，真正要做的时候呢，还离这个真正要做还是有一个过程的。嗯，但是在荷兰好像不是。就是你说做好了，行了，这就得做了，就是这样的。这个差距就我觉得就是非常非常的明显哈。我觉得呢，这就是让我感觉区别就很大了，因为呢，在中国的话呢，不会是这样的。就是所有的事情来讲的话呢，尤其是大的事情来讲的话，大家是一个这个鱼和水的关系，是鱼和水的关系，互相的是依靠。但是呢，真正的决策的话，因为什么呢？因为毕竟是老板是投资人。Het is een complex situatie als jij door een vreemde geldschieter in een, in een andere cultuur een club gaat runnen. Een voetbalclub. Want wij doen zaken met 456 Chinese bedrijven in Nederland. Kruidvat is in Chinese handen. Meneer Li Ka-shing zal zich nooit met het kruidvat bemoeien. Ik bedoel, daar zit Nederlands management en, en zo hoort het ook. Je moet je aanpassen aan de cultuur. Mag en toen mag vroeger. Ik had zelf ook wel het idee toen we de transactie aangingen dat Wang veel internationaler is dan een Chinees. En ik denk ook eigenlijk dat hij dat wel is. Want zijn vrouw, heb ik begrepen, heeft, dacht ik, ze hebben lang in Canada gewoond, gestudeerd. En dus ja, het is ook wel, ze doen zich af en toe ook wel een beetje naïef voor. Ja. Terwijl ze veel beter weten hoe de wereld in elkaar zit misschien dan wij denken. Ja, dat is interessant, want dan is er een andere agenda. Nou ja, Maarten gaf er net wat over aan. Hè. Kijk, toen we de gesprekken voerden, dachten we in eerste instantie... we hebben met meneer Wang te maken als directeur van United Twente. En in onze cultuur is het daarmee ook eigenlijk klaar. En successiefelijk zijn we de maanden daarna, wat Maarten ook aan refereerde... Ja, kreeg ik ook wel uh, ja, 100% bevestigd is dat niet. Maar uh, vandaag denk ik ook, hij kan het niet alleen beslissen. Hè. Hij heeft gewoon met andere mensen in China te maken. Daar werkt het dan blijkbaar zo dat voordat er uh, ja, weer een volgende stap gezet wordt... hij wel degelijk moet overleggen, wellicht met aandeelhouders, uh, dan toch. Uh, waarbij wij misschien denken, jij bent directeur van het bedrijf... dus jij kan dat vertegenwoordigen, maar daar werkt het dus anders. Maar ik denk dat ik niet heel erg goed is wat ik heb gedaan. Ik denk dat ik niet heel erg goed is wat ik heb gedaan. Ik heb het niet heel erg goed is wat ik heb gedaan. Ik heb het niet heel erg goed is wat ik heb gedaan. Ik heb het niet heel erg goed. 那我告诉你我什么时候会，那你就按照这个去给我做计划就行了。底下人我要跟你说吗？或者其他人我要跟你说没无关的，我跟你说，哎，告诉你，我得我要汇钱啊，我要打的要要要汇多多少钱去？为什么要告诉你啊？那是我的钱呢。俱乐部又是我们的俱乐部，是我们投资的俱俱乐部啊。那怎么做的话呢？我干嘛要跟你说呀、啊
。所以我觉得这就很奇怪，这就是又是一个文化差异的问题。在中国的话，没有人这个 care 你这些东西的，没有任何东西，就是你你去就去去管这个的，你还倒倒是那什么了，你不能到外面去说你老板不好。Bijna elke patatzaak in Nederland wordt overgenomen door een Chinees. Merk jij wat van een cultuurverschil? Je kan nog steeds je patatje oorlog kopen. Ik kon niet, ik kon niet traceren wat die Chinees dan met aardig moest. Dat ging nog steeds niet. Het viel wel op in het begin bij de supporters. Er was wel enthousiasme. Ja, maar ja, dat is logisch. Iemand, je speelt altijd rond de 14e, 15e plaats. Je speelt eigenlijk voor handhaving elk jaar. En dan komt er iemand binnen en die zegt van, wij gaan binnen drie jaar gaan we die linkerkant bestormen en dan gaan we Europees voetbal halen. Ja, nou ja, dan als supporters. Zijn, daar word je daar vrolijk van. We hebben hem heel lang de hand boven het hoofd gehouden. De hele tijd van, nou ja, cultureel verschilletje en dit en dat. Ja, tot zeg maar 18 december, dat de laatste deadline weer verliep. Toen 5 januari, toen was het over. Ja, maar ik wil, dat wil ik gelijk op inhaken. Dat woordje wat jij zegt, dat woordje cultuurverschil. Dan maak ik me constant kwaad om, weet je. Ik, 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 het woordje cultuurverschil, dat is, het, dat, is het, uh, dat is absoluut het meest misbruikte woord in 2015 ja. geweest. Uh, maar meneer Wang deed dat ook. En aan alle kanten werd er gezegd, ja, maar jongens, China en Nederland is cultuurverschil. Wat de fuck is cultuurverschil? Je komt hier, je koopt hier een club, je verrampeneert die club. En dan gaat onze, onze algeheel directeur, Jan Willem Wicht, die het in mijn ogen fantastisch doet. Die moet iets naar buiten brengen, want die man die moet een keer iets naar buiten brengen. En dan zeggen ze, hij heeft hem beledigd. Hij heeft hem beledigd? Wat moet die man dan? Moet die man gaan zwijgen? Als het gaf. En dan zeggen ze, ja, maar is cultuurverschil, jongens. Dat, dat, dat kennen ze daar niet. Dat is een belediging van een Chinees. Jongens, een belediging is dat als je gewoon je centjes belooft over te maken, dan fucking pay dat geld. Dan is, je belooft iets, leg dat dan neer. Dan breng je andere mensen niet in de problemen. En daar wordt iedere keer maar weer het woordje wat jij gebruikt, dat woordje cultuurverschil, daar ben ik echt helemaal klaar mee. Ja, zoals we verleden jaar in Nederland naar de Griek gingen, gaan we nu hier in de regio Den Haag naar de Chinees. Ja, dat we bij de Griek waren van nou betaal niet, want we hebben al genoeg naar je gegeven. Ja. Precies, zo ging het, hè, als je je gierels ging ophalen. Maar zo gaan we nu naar de Chinees. Nou, maar, maar het is wel een lolletje, je betaalt ook wel gewoon, maar dat is voor die mensen. Die eer is daar heel belangrijk. Hoe gaat het met je zus? Ben je met de bobbies of ben je met de zus? I mean, I think balance is very important in the way the Chinese think. I suppose there's a greater recognition of the complexity of life as a result, you know, and that therefore, you know, bad things, things go wrong and so on. Having said that, remember that the Chinese have a much more positive view of human nature than we do, you know, because in the Christian tradition, um, uh, uh, you know, we need to be saved from ourselves, from our sins. The Chinese don't have that view. The Chinese view is that, uh, you know, if you are brought up in the right kind of way, your parents, are, you're subject to good parenting and good influences and good education, you'll be, you can be a good person. So it's a much more positive philosophy than, than the Christian tradition. He and the mission. 他有一个使命，他总是要把别的人不信基督教的人变成信基督教，把和自己生活方式不一样的人变成用自己的生活方式来生活。中国不是正好相反。美国的为什么我们中国认为美国的政策叫霸权主义呢？它是霸道，不是王道。就在于美国是对外输出自己的价值观，就是说，比如说他我说去解放利比亚。解放伊拉克，他认为伊拉克的政治制度和意识形态跟我不一样，我把你们解放了，人让你们跟我们一样，这是从儒家思想讲，这是很错误的一个的。儒家讲的是叫做“来而不拒，不往教之”，就你要跟我学，我教你；你要不跟我学，我绝不会去你那儿来派军队去改造你，这是错误的。霸权主义就是用暴力来改变别人的思想和制度。而中国的传统观念里边讲道义是不能去改变别人，这是区别。美国就是太希望把别的国家变得跟美国一样。<笑> In the long run, of course, the international system will be utterly transformed by the rise of China. Utterly transformed. It is inconceivable that this will not happen. The fact is that. Um, since the financial crisis, uh, the global economy 
has been extremely dependent on the performance of the Chinese economy, much more dependent on the Chinese economy than the American economy, much greater contributor to global growth than the, the American economy has been nearly stagnant. The Chinese economy has carried on growing. And I think that the, 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 this is, uh, this is um, sort of in some way recognized now by it, the reaction, the concern in the West about the health of the Chinese economy. There is definitely concern. After decades of almost hallucinatory growth, the atmosphere changed late in the summer of 2015. Totally unexpectedly, the Chinese central bank announced a devaluation of the Chinese currency, the RMB. Up to that point, it had been fixed to the dollar. Now people lost faith in the sustainability of the global economy, which caused panic on the stock market and the currency markets. Before the financial crisis of 2008, investor Jim Rogers had moved to Singapore to be close to the Chinese Golden Mountains. In his opinion, what would be the consequences of a Chinese crisis? The Chinese currency has been the strongest currency in the world for the past 10 years. Now, China has its own problems too. Uh, in 2008, when the world had a problem, China had huge amounts of money saved up for a rainy day. It started raining, they started spending. But now China too has debt. China's built up a fair amount of debt here in the past eight years, which they never had before for historic reasons. So China's going to be in more difficulty this time around than before. Okay. Um, so what caused this debt of China? Well, partly when the, when the world got into trouble and the Chinese government started spending money, they encouraged all the provinces and companies to spend money as well. And so they went out and started borrowing money. Uh, that now there's a, a, a market in China for, for lending much more than it ever was before at the banks and outside the banks. We are facing worse times than we had in 2008 because the debt is so, so, so much higher now and the money printing has been staggering since then. The central bank in the United States in, 19, in 2008 had a balance sheet of 800 million US dollars. Now it has nearly five trillion. It's gone up over 500%, 600% in those seven or eight years. That is a lot of debt. Uh, the US government debt is up by trillions since then. Europe, you talk about austerity. No country in Europe has lower debt now than it had in 2008 or even last year. Every European country has higher debt this year than last year, and next year the debt's gonna be higher again. So no, we've got staggering amounts of debt now. Staggering amounts of money have been printed. It's gonna be worse next time around. Be worried. And so we don't have China to save us this time. Well, China is in better shape than most of us, but China too has debt now. China's built up its own debt. Nothing like the US, nothing like some of the European countries, nothing like Great Britain, but China too has debt now. I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. I don't like it either. <laughs> Let me say again, you should be knowledgeable, you should be worried, and you should be prepared. I don't like it at all. You know, I'd like to just be able to look out the window and say, oh, things are great. I don't have to think and worry about anything. But now I look out the window and I see artificial oceans of liquidity, artificial liquidity. I see storms coming. The global storm predicted by Jim Rogers is already wreaking havoc in America. But what exactly is the link between Chinese financial policy and the panic in the West? According to investor Peter Schiff, the Chinese play a game that will eventually lead to a different monetary system in which the dollar will no longer be leading. I don't think it was the Chinese devaluation that caused it. In fact, markets were falling before the Chinese did that. It is why they did it. It's because the world is bracing for higher interest rates in the United States 
and for the strong dollar to continue to strengthen. And that's what put all the pressure on the Chinese currency because the Chinese RMB has been rising in value along with the dollar relative to all of the currencies of its trading partners. And so the Chinese are now trying to allow their currency to trade more freely with other currencies instead of being rigidly fixed to the dollar. Peter Schiff thinks America will try to pin the blame for its own economic problems on China. He foresees a battle between two economic superpowers in which the supremacy of the currency is at stake. Well, I think the Chinese realize the extent to which the United States is in trouble. I mean, they have to. And the question is, how do the Chinese go about preparing for it? I mean, it's always puzzled me that the Chinese would have enabled this to go on for so long. I mean, look how many dollars they've accumulated. I mean, we owe them trillions. And obviously, that can't go on forever. And it's only going on now because people haven't come to that conclusion. They still think America is good for its debts. When they figure out that it's not, it's, it's a game changer. And I think the dollar is ultimately going to collapse. And when that happens, the Chinese RMB is going to take off. I think this is a head fake move with the Chinese currency going down. The real move is going to be upwards. And you know, it's, this is a two-edged sword. Yes, the Chinese are allowing the, their currency to fall now, but that means they're preparing to allow it to rise once the dollar turns direction. And if the Chinese are no longer there to prop up the dollar, the next time it falls, it's not going to stop. And that's imminent. Yes, and I, and I think the Chinese understand this, and I think the Chinese are preparing for a post-U.S. dollar reserve currency world. I think that's one of the reasons that they've been buying up so much gold. You know, the Chinese are the world's largest producers of gold, but they don't export any of it. They actually import gold. And I think the government has been less than honest about how much gold they actually own, because I don't think they want the markets to realize how large their appetite is. And I do believe that over the last few years, as so many speculators have been selling gold on the anticipation of this strong dollar and rising interest rates, I think the Chinese have been quietly buying. Well, I think, again, I think that's going to be a positive development. I think the monetary system we have now does not work. I mean, you can't really have a monetary system without money, and that's what we have. Uh, we just have a little piece of paper, but there's no intrinsic value there. I mean, gold is money because gold is a commodity. I mean, money needs to be a commodity. It has to have value. It can't just be a piece of paper that governments can create out of thin air uh, because there's no limit to how much they can create. And you have no idea what the supply is going to be in the future. So I think the sooner we can get off the system that we're on now, the better. The international financial system is now in many ways is very flawed. We know that and we know it's unstable and we know we could hit another financial crisis and we know it's far too dependent on the dollar as a reserve currency and so on. New institutions will arise according to circumstances because ultimately it's about what the global economy requires, what it needs, what kind of financial reform is appropriate. The IMF and the World Bank will be increasingly marginal. The AIB has more capital than the World Bank. Yeah, and they're a startup. Or and they're a start they're a startup, yeah. So the US and Japan have stayed out so far. What do you think about that? We are have they been very foolish? I'm sorry, you should you pick your words more carefully. <laughs> now that's your job, not mine. No, I never say they are foolish. I understand it might be difficult for some countries, for whatever reason, to make a decision to join. So my idea is very clear. The door keeps open for any country to join as long as they accept the Arctic Agreement, which was worked out by the 57 founding members. However, Martin, I hope you won't think I'm not good enough or not nice enough. It's unfair for me to invite you to my party tonight again and again, and you reject again and again. That's not fair. China proposed 
，结果呢遭到了美国的抵制，所以他不让中国进行这些金融改革，中国没有办法，只好搞设立一些个金融机构，是金砖银行、呃亚投行、AIB， 然后什么这个上合组织银行。然后和中欧的这个、呃，中国和东欧的这个合作基金，是因为中国想加入在那个国际体系的机构里边进行改革的时候，美被美国阻止了，中国没办法，只好重新再建立。简单的讲 ，AIB 的名称是什么呀？叫亚洲基础设施投资银行。一开始这个建议就没有超越这个地区，就是说在东亚地区搞基础设施，它怎么变成一个全球性机构呢？是因为英国、德国、法国、澳大利亚、加拿大，是因为他们的加入，它变成了一个全球性的。这不是中国要让它变成，是这些国家把它变成全球性的。然后，<笑>然后又说是中国要搞全球的。<笑> so you just said they are preparing for a post-dollar monetary system. What is that going to look like, and what is China's interest?、Uh, I think the Chinese would have been better off had they not made this mistake, had they not pegged their currency to the dollar, and had they simply allowed their currency to appreciate. And there's no reason for the dollar to be the reserve currency. In fact, the dollar being the reserve currency is the source, a source of financial instability throughout the world, because the entire world is forced to support the United States, and it's a very expensive habit. And the fact that the dollar is so overvalued distorts decisions. It distorts capital flows. And as I said, it is the main source of financial problems and instability throughout the world. I mean, in order for China to keep its relationship with the dollar, they had to keep expanding their own money supply. They had to keep interest rates too low. They had to keep printing money. So all of this distorts the economy. But the main difference between China and the United States is China's economy is still viable. China has an enormous industrial capacity. China has all sorts of production, and and so when this this collapse happens, the difference between America and China is China is still going to have all the factories and they're going to have all the production. What's going to change is their consumers. Chinese citizens are going to have all the goods that these factories produce. America is going to have to go without that. We're just going to have the money we print. But what good is that? I mean, money doesn't have any value if you can't buy anything with it. The sooner the world gets off this dollar standard, the better off the world is going to be. And so we pass into the inevitable Chinese world order, an order with clear contours. Instead of enforcing supremacy, you win admiration, so everyone will want to be like you. That China's ambition is what? China wants to make others admire China. 希望别人尊重中国。哎呀，你看中国真好，你看中国人家怎么怎么。中国希望被别人尊重，被别人羡慕，被别人这个呃欣赏。他只不过就是西方比中国强大，他认为西方比咱们文，比我们文明。当他比别人强大时，他又调过来说：“你看我比你文明。”就是应该，所有的人都应该向什么成功者学习，学习成功者优秀的地方，然后改进自己，使自己成为一个成功者。欧洲现在面临的问题就在这：如果欧洲继续认为自己是世界上最优秀的，而不看到自己欧洲现在开始走向衰落，那么欧洲只会衰落速度更快，而不会逆转。欧洲人呢，就是比较喜欢报复，这是跟儒家文化很不同的一点，是吧？就是特别就是我要报复，我要要要用军事手段要报仇，就是报仇的心理在欧洲文化中间特比中国文化中间有严重的多，是吧？欧洲的这个莎士比亚写的那些剧里很多都是复仇剧，欧洲的很多小说都是复仇的小说，是吧？基呃什么基督山呃伯爵的那个那个那些小说就是。复仇是人一种天生的一种心理，而中国传统文化是说这种复仇的心理应该得到压制。所以，就如果你说中国对欧洲有什么借鉴，就中国就说是欧洲不要有太强烈的报仇心理。
China historically has had a culturally very different way of looking at its relationship with the world. I think what we'll see is a world in which China exercises far more economic power than the United States ever has, even at its peak. But it won't be a political... It, it, won't, it won't interfere in the governance of other countries in the way in which the Western tradition has. And that, that era that we've, we, that, that we've lived through has been, in my view, an extremely authoritarian and undemocratic world system. And the great change that's happening now is that with the rise of the developing world, where 85% of the world's population lives, they increasingly are acquiring, are being enfranchised, acquiring a voice, acquiring a say in the future of the world. So in a rough and ready way, this is something to be hugely embraced. We are moving towards a world which is no longer essentially ruled by a tiny minority of the human population, as increasingly uh, uh, the majority of the world's population will be, as it were, in some way or other, running it. <laughs> Ich hoffe, dass Ihnen das Video gefallen hat. Klicken Sie hier, um das empfohlene Video anzusehen. Bitte abonnieren Sie unseren Kanal, um Updates über VPRO-Doc zu erhalten.